Chapter 51 of Charles Dickens' Nicholas Nickleby, in which we are given an insight into the home life of Mr. Arthur Gride, and we meet his somewhat unusual housekeeper. In an old house, dismal, dark and dusty, which seemed to have withered like himself and to have grown yellow and shriveled in hoarding him from the light of day as he had in hoarding his money, lived Arthur Gride. Meagre old chairs and tables of spare and bony make and hard and cold as misers' hearts were ranged in grim array against the gloomy walls. Attenuated presses, they would be cabinets. Grown lank and lantern jawed in guarding the treasures they enclosed and tottering as though from constant fear and dread of thieves, shrunk up in dark corners whence they cast no shadows on the ground and seemed to hide and cower from observation. A tall, grim clock upon the stairs, with long, lean hands and famished face, ticked in cautious whispers, and when it struck the time, in thin and piping sounds like an old man's voice, it rattled as if it were pinched with hunger. No fireside couch was there to invite repose and comfort. Elbow chairs were there, but they looked uneasy in their minds, cocked their arms suspiciously and timidly and kept on their guard. Others were fantastically grim and gaunt, as having drawn themselves up to their utmost height and put on their fiercest looks to stare all comers out of countenance. Others again, knocked up against their neighbours, or leaned for support against the wall, somewhat ostentatiously, as if to call all men to witness that they were not worth the taking. The dark square lumbering bedsteads seemed built for restless dreams. The musty hangings seemed to creep in scanty folds together, whispering among themselves when rustled by the wind, their trembling knowledge of the tempting wares that lurked within the dark and tight locked closets. From out of the most spare and hungry room in all this spare and hungry house, there came one morning a tremulous noise as of old Gride's voice. It feebly chirped forth the fag end of some forgotten song of which the burden ran. Tan, tan, to throw the old shoe and may the wedding be lucky. Which he repeated in the same quavering tones again and again until a violent fit of coughing obliged him to desist and to pursue in silence the, the occupation upon which he was engaged. This occupation was to take down from the shelves of the worm-eaten wardrobe a quantity of frosty garments, one by one, to subject each to a careful and minute inspection by holding it up against the light and folding it with great exactness and lay it on one or other of two little heaps beside him. He never took two articles of clothing out together, but always brought them forth singly and never failed to shut the wardrobe door and turn the key between each visit to his shelves. The snuff-coloured suit, said Arthur Gride, surveying the third threadbare coat. Do I look well? In snuff colour, let me think. 
The result of his cogitations appeared to be unfavourable, for he folded the garment once again and laid it aside and mounted on a chair to get down another, chirping while he did so. Young, loving and fair, oh, what happiness there, and may the wedding be lucky. They always put in young said old Arthur. But songs are only written for the sake of rhyme, and this is a silly one that the poor country people sang when I was a little boy. Don't stop. Young. Young is quite right. It, it means the bride. Oh, yes. <laughs> it means the bride. Oh, dear. That's good. That's very good and true besides. Quite true. In the satisfaction of this discovery, he went over the verse again with increased expression and a shake or two here and there. He then resumed his employment. The bottle green, said old Arthur. The bottle green was a famous suit to wear, and I bought it very cheap at a pawnbroker's. Ha! And there was, <laughs> there was a tarnished shilling in the waistcoat pocket. Oh, to think that the pawnbroker shouldn't have known that it was there. <laughs> oh, I knew it. I felt it when I was examining the quality. Oh, what a dull dog of a pawnbroker. It was a lucky suit to this bottle green. The very day I put it on first, old Mallowford was burnt to death in his bed and all the post obits fell in. <laughs> I'll be married in bottle green, Peg. Peg slide askew, I'll be married in bottle green. This call, loudly repeated twice or thrice at the room door, brought into the apartment a short, thin, weazen, blear-eyed old woman, palsy-stricken and hideously ugly, who, wiping her shriveled face upon her dirty apron, inquired in that subdued tone which deaf people commonly speak, was that you a calling, or only the clock a striking? My hearing gets so bad, I never know which is which. But when I hears a noise, I knows it must be one or the other. Cause nothing else stirs in this house. It was me, pig said Arthur Gride, tapping himself on the breast to render the reply more intelligible. You, eh? returned Peg. And what do you want? I'll be married in the bottle green, cried Arthur Gride. It's a deal too good to be married in, master, rejoined Peg after a short inspection of the suit. Haven't you got anything worse than this? Nothing that'll do, replied old Arthur. Why not do, retorted Peg. Why don't you wear your every clothes, your everyday clothes like a man, eh? Because they ain't becoming enough, Peg, returned her master. Not what enough, said Peg. Becoming. Becoming what, said Peg sharply. Not becoming too old to wear. Arthur Gride muttered an, impre an imprecation on his housekeeper's deafness as he roared in her ear. Not smart enough. I want to look as well as I can. Look, cried Peg. 
If she's as handsome as you say she is, she won't look much at you, master. Take your oath on that. And as to how you look yourself, pepper and salt, bottle green, sky blue or tartan plaid, that won't make no difference to you. With which consulatory assurance, Peg Slide askew, gathered up the chosen suit, and folding her skinny arms upon the bundle, stood mouthing and grinning and blinking her watery eyes, like an uncouth figure in some monstrous piece of carving. You're in a funny mood today, ain't you, Peg? said Arthur, with not the best possible grace. Why isn't it enough to make me, rejoined the old woman. I shall be soon put out, though, if anyone tries to domineer it over me. And so I give you notice, master. Nobody shall be put over Peg Slider Skew's head after so many years. You know that, and I don't need to tell you. That won't do for me, no, no, nor for you. Try that once and come to ruin, ruin, ruin. Oh, dear, dear, I shall never try it, said Arthur Gride, appalled by the mention of the word. Not for the word. It, it, it wouldn't be very easy to ruin me. We must be very careful, Peg. More saving than ever, with another mouth to feed. Uh, only, only we mustn't let her lose her good looks, Peg. No, we mustn't let her lose her good looks, because I like to see them. <laughs> Take care you don't find good looks come expensive, returned Peg, shaking her forefinger. But she can earn money for herself, Peg, said Arthur Gride, eagerly watching what effect this communication produced upon the old woman's countenance. She can draw, paint, and, and, and work all manner of pretty things for ornament in stalls and chairs and slippers and, and watch guards, Peg, and hair chains and a, a thousand other little dainty trifles I couldn't give you half the names of. And, and she can play the piano. And, and what's more, she got one. And, and, and she'll sing like a little bird. She'll be very cheap to dress and, and keep, Peg. Don't you think she will? If you don't let her make a fool of you, she may, returned Peg. A fool of me, exclaimed Arthur. Trust your old master not to be fooled by pretty faces, Peg. No, 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 nor by ugly ones neither, Mrs. Slider Skew, he softly added by way of soliloquy. You're a-saying something you don't want me to hear, said Peg. I knows you are. Oh dear, the devil's in this woman muttered Arthur, adding with an ugly leer, I said I trusted everything to you, Peg, that was all. You do that, master, and all your cares are over, said Peg approvingly. When I do that, Peg Slider Skew, thought Arthur Gride, they will be... Although he thought this very distinctly, he durst not move his lips lest the old woman should detect him. He even seemed half afraid that she might have read his thoughts, for he leered coaxingly at her, and he said aloud, Take all those loose stitches in the bottle green with the best black silk, have a skein of the best, and, and, and put some new buttons on the coat, and, 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 and this is a good idea, pig. <laughs> Yes, this you'll like this one. I, I, I know you will. As I've never given her anything yet, and girls like 
such attentions. You shall polish up a, a little sparkling necklace that I've got upstairs, and I'll give it to her upon the wedding morning. I clasp it around her charming little neck myself and take it away the next day. Ha 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 ha! I'll lock it up for her peg and lose it. Who'll be the fool then, I wonder, to begin with? A hey, peg! Mrs. Slyderskew appeared to approve highly of this ingenious scheme and expressed her satisfaction by various rackings and twitchings of her head and body, which by no means enhanced her charms. These she prolonged until she had hobbled out of the door, when she exchanged them for a sour, malignant look, and twisting her under jaw from side to side, muttered hearty curses upon the future Mrs. Gride as she crept slowly down the stairs and paused for breath at nearly every one. She's half a witch, I think, said Arthur Gride when he found himself alone again. But she's very frugal. She's very deaf. Her living costs me next to nothing, and it's no use her listening at keyholes, because she can't hear. She's a charming woman for the purpose, a most discreet old housekeeper, and worth her weight in copper. Having extolled the merits of his domestic drudge in these high terms, Old Arthur went back to the burden of his song. The suit destined to grace his approaching nuptials being now selected, he replaced the others with no less care than he had displayed in drawing them forth from the musty nooks where they had silently reposed for many years. Startled by a ring at the door, he hastily concluded this operation and locked up the cabinet. But there was no need for any particular hurry, as the discreet peg seldom knew the bell was rung unless she had happened to cast her dim eyes upwards and she it see it shaking against the kitchen ceiling. Nevertheless, after a short delay, she tottered in, followed by Newman Noggs. Ah, Mr Noggs, cried Arthur Gride rubbing his hands. My good friend, Mr. Noggs, what news do you bring me? Newman, with a, a steadfast and immovable aspect and his eye fixed, fixedly, replied, suiting the action to the word. A letter from Mr. Nickleby. Bear up a weight. Uh, wouldn't you take a, a... Newman looked up and smacked his lips. A chair? No, said Newman. Thank you. Arthur opened the letter with trembling hands and devoured its contents with the utmost greediness, chuckling rapturously over it and reading it several times before he could take it from before his eyes. So many times did he peruse and re-peruse it, that Newman considered it expedient to remind him of his presence. Answer, said Newman, bearer awaits. Oh, true, true, replied old Arthur. Yes, yes, yeah, I almost forgot, I do declare. I thought you was forgetting, said Newman. Quite, quite right to remind me, Mr. Noggs. Oh, very, very right indeed, said Arthur. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll write a line. I'm, 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 I'm rather flurried, Mr. Noggs. The news is bad, interrupted Newman. No, 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 Mr. Noggs. No, no, it, the news is good. 
the, the very best of news. Sit, sit down, I'll, I'll, I'll get a pen and ink and write a line to your master, Mr. Nobbs. He speaks of you in such terms sometimes that, oh dear, you, you would be astonished. I may say that sometimes, sometimes uh, I do too, and, and always did. <laughs> I always say the same of you. That's cursed Mr. Noggs with all my heart, then, if you do, thought Newman, as Gride hurried out. The letter had fallen on the ground. Looking carefully about him for an instant, Newman, impelled by curiosity to know the result of the design he had overheard from his office closet, caught it up and rapidly read, as follows. Gride, I saw Bray again this morning and proposed the day after tomorrow as you suggested for the marriage. There is no objection on his part and all days are alike to his daughter. We will go together and you must be with me by seven in the morning. I need not tell you to be punctual. Make no further visits to the girl in the meantime. You have been there of late much oftener than you should. She does not language for you, and it might be dangerous. Restrain your youthful ardour for eight and forty hours and leave her to her father. You only undo what he does and does well. Yours, Ralph Nickleby. A footstep was heard without. Newman dropped the letter on the same spot again, pressed it with his foot to provide it fluttering to... to prevent its fluttering away. Regaining his seat in a single stride, he looked so vacant and unconscious as ever mortal looked. Arthur Gride, after peering nervously about him, spied it on the ground, picked it up and setting down to right, glanced at Newman Noggs, who was staring at the wall with an intensity so remarkable that Arthur was quite alarmed. Do you see anything in particular, Mr. Noggs? said Arthur, trying to follow the direction of Newman's eyes, which was an impossibility and a thing no man had ever done. Only a cobweb, replied Newman. Ah, oh, is that all? No, said Newman. There's a fly in it. There's a good many cobwebs here, observed Arthur Gride. So there are in our place returned Newman, and flies too. Newman appeared to derive great entertainment from this repartee, and to the great discomposure of Arthur Gride's nerves, produced a series of sharp cracks from his finger joints, resembling the noise of a distant discharge of small artillery. Arthur succeeded in finishing his reply to Ralph's note, nevertheless, and at length handed it over to the eccentric men messenger for delivery. That's it, Mr. Noggs, said Gride. Newman gave a nod, put it in his hat and was shuffling away when Gride, whose doting delight knew no bounds, beckoned him to come back again and said in a shrill whisper and with a grin that puckered up his whole face and almost obscured his eyes. Will you... Will you take a little drop of something? Ha 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 ha, eh? Just, just a taste. In good fellowship, if Arthur Gride had been capable of it, Newman would not have drunk with him one bubble of the richest wine that was ever made, but to see what he was at and to punish him as much as he could, he accepted the offer immediately. Arthur Gride, therefore, again applied himself to the press. And from a shelf laden with tall Flemish drinking glasses and quaint bottles, some with necks like so many storks, others with square Dutch built bodies and short, fat, apoplectic throats, took down one dusty bottle of promising appearance and two glasses of curiously small size. 
You've never tasted this, said Arthur. It's odor, golden water. I like it on account of its name. It's a delicious name. Water of gold, golden water. Oh, dear me, it seems quite a sin to drink it. As his courage appeared to be fast failing him, and he trifled with the stopper in a manner which threatened the dismissal of the bottle to its old place, Newman took up one of his glasses and clinked it twice or thrice against the bottle, as a gentle reminder that he had not yet been helped. With a deep sigh, Arthur Gride slowly filled it, though not to the brim, and then filled his own. Stop, stop, don't, don't drink it yet, he said, laying his hand on Newman's. It was given me 20 years ago, when I took a little taste, and which I very seldom do. I, I like to think of it beforehand and tease myself. <laughs> We'll drink a toast, shall we? Shall we drink a toast, Mr. Noggs? Ah, said Newman, eyeing his little glass impatiently. Look sharp, bearer awaits. Why then, I'll tell you what, tittered Arthur. We'll drink, <laughs> we'll drink to a lady. The ladies? said Newman. No, 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 Mr. Noggs, replied Gride, arresting his hand. A lady. You wonder to hear me say, a lady. I know you do. I know you do. Here's little Madeline. That's the toast, Mr. Noggs. Little Madeline. Madeline said Newman, inwardly adding, and God help her. The rapidity and unconcern with which Newman dismissed his poor portion of the golden water had a great effect upon the old man, who sat upright in his chair and gazed at him open-mouthed as if the sight had taken his breath away. Quite unmoved, however, Newman left him to stop his at his own le uh, leisure and pour it back into the bottle, if he chose, and departed. After greatly outraging the dignity of Peg Sliderskew by brushing past her in the passage without a word of apology or recognition. Mr. Gride and his housekeeper immediately, on being left alone, resolved themselves into a, a committee of ways and means and discussed the arrangements which should be made for the reception of the young bride. As they were, like some other committees, extremely dull and prolix in debate, this history may pursue the footsteps of Newman Noggs, thereby combining advantage with necessity, for it would have been necessary to do so under any circumstances, and necessity has no law, as the world knows well. You have been a very long time, said Ralph, when Newman returned. He was a very long time, replied Newman. Bah! cried Ralph impatiently. Give me his note if he gave you one, his message if he didn't, and don't go away. I want a word with you, sir. Newman handed in the note and looked very virtuous and innocent while his employer broke the seal and glanced his eye over it. Mm, he'll be sure to come, muttered Ralph as he tore it into pieces. Why, of course, I know he'll be sure to come. What need to say that? Knox, pray, sir, answer me this. What man was that with whom I saw you in the street last night? I don't know, replied Newman. You'd better refresh your memory, sir, said Ralph with a threatening look. I tell you returned Newman boldly. I don't know. He came here twice and asked for you. You were out. He came again. He packed himself off. He gave me the name of Brooker. Yes, I know he did, said Ralph. What then? What then? Why, 
He lurked about and dogged me in the street. He follows me night after night and, and urges me to bring him face to face with you. He says he says he has been once and, and, and not long ago either. He wants to see you face to face, he says, and, and, and you'll soon hear him out, he warrants. And what do you say to that? inquired Ralph, looking keenly at his drudge. That's no business of mine, and I won't. I told him he might catch you in the street if that was all he wanted, but no, he said it, that wouldn't do. You wouldn't hear a word there, he said. He must have you alone in a room with the door locked where he, he can speak without fear and, 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 and you'd soon change your tone and hear him patiently. The audacious dog! Ralph muttered. That's all I know, said Newman. I say again, I don't know what man he is. I don't believe he knows himself. You've seen him, perhaps you do. Yes, I think I do, replied Ralph. Well, retorted Newman sulkily, don't expect me to know him too, that's all. You'll ask me next why I never told you this before. What would you say if I was to tell you all that people say about you? What would you call me then? Brute ass and snap your fingers at me like a dragon, I'll be bound. That was true enough. Though the question which Newman anticipated was in fact already upon Ralph's lips at that moment. He is an idle ruffian, said Ralph, a vagabond from beyond the sea where he travelled for his crimes, a felon let loose to run his neck into a halter, a swindler who has the audacity to try his schemes on me, who know him well. The next time he tampers with you, hand him over to the police for attempting to extort money by lies and threats, do you hear? And leave the rest to me. He shall call his heels in jail in a little time. I'll be bound he looks for other folks, folks to fleece when he comes out. You mind what I say, do you? I hear, said Newman. Well, do it then, returned Ralph, and I'll reward you. Now, you may go. Newman readily availed himself of the permission and shutting himself up in his little office remained there in a very serious cogitation all day. When he was released at night, he proceeded with the expedition he could use to the city and took up his old position behind the pump to which Nicholas have recommended him, for Newman Noggs was proud in his way and couldn't bear to appear to his friend before the brothers Cheerable in the shabby and degraded state to which he was now reduced. He hadn't occupied this position many minutes when he was rejoiced to see Nicholas approaching and darted out his from his ambuscade to meet him. Nicholas, on his part, was no less pleased to encounter his friend, whom he had not seen for some time, so their greeting was a warm one. I was thinking about you at that very moment, said Nicholas. That's right, rejoined Newman, and I of you, I, I, I couldn't help coming up tonight. I, I say, I say, I, I think I'm going to find something out. And what may that be, returned Nicholas, smiling at this odd communication. I don't know what it may be. I don't know what it may not be, said Newman. It's some secret in which your uncle is concerned, but but what uh, I, I've not yet been able to discover. Although I have my strong suspicions, I, I'll not hint them now in, in case you should be disappointed. I disappointed? cried Nicholas. Am I interested? Oh, yes, I think you are, replied Newman. I have a crotchet in my head that, that it must be so. I have found out a man who plainly knows more than he cares to tell at once. And he's already dropped some hints to me as puzzle me, as, 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 as they puzzle me, said Newman, scratching his red nose into a state of violent inflammation and staring at Nicholas with all his might and main meanwhile. 
Admiring what could have wound his friend up into such a pitch of mystery, Nicholas endeavoured by a series of questions to elucidate the case, but in vain. Newman couldn't be drawn into any more explicit statement than a repetition of the perplexities he had already thrown out and a confused oration showing how it was necessary to use the utmost caution, how the lynx-eyed Ralph had already seen him in company with his unbeknown correspondent, and how baffled the said Ralph by extreme guardedness of manner and ingenuity of speech, having prepared himself for such a contingency from the first. Remembering his companion's prosperity, which was quite large and generous, Nicholas drew him into a sequestered tavern. Here they fell to reviewing the, or reviewing the origin and progress of their acquaintance, as men sometimes do, and tracing out the little events by which it was most strongly marked they came at last to the young lady with whom Nicholas was so deeply in love. That reminds me, said Newman. You've never told me the young lady's real name. Madeline, said Nicholas. Madeline, cried Newman. What Madeline, her her other name, say her other name. Bray, said Nicholas in great astonishment. It's the same, it's the same, cried Newman. Sad story. Can you stand idly by and let the unnatural marriage take place without one attempt to save her? What do you mean, exclaimed Nicholas, staring up. Marriage? Are you mad? Are you, is she, are you blind, deaf, senseless, dead, said Newman. Do you know that within one day, by means of your Uncle Ralph, she will be married to a man as bad as he, and worse, if worse there is, do you know that within one day she will be sacrificed, as sure as you stand there alive, to a hoary wretch, a devil born and bred in grey devil's ways. Be careful what you say, replied Nicholas. For heaven's sake, be careful. I, I, I am left here alone, and, 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 and those who would stretch out a hand to rescue her are, are far away. What is it you mean? Tell me what you mean. I never heard her name said Newman, choking with his energy. What, why didn't you tell me? How was I to know? We, we might at least have had some time to think. What is it that you mean? cried Nicholas. It was not an easy task to arrive at this information, but after a great quantity of extraordinary pantomime, which in no way assisted it, Nicholas who was almost as wild as Newman by this time, forced the latter down upon his seat and held him down until he began to tell his tale. Rage, astonishment, indignation, and a storm of passion rushed through the listener's heart as the plot was laid bare. He no sooner understood at all than with a face of ashy paleness and trembling in every limb, Nicholas darted from the house. Stop him, cried Newman, bolting out in pursuit. He'll do something desperate. He'll murder somebody. Hello there, stop him. Stop thief, stop thief. 